last two lectures that we will have talk about advanced C++ topics. I find these topics very interesting and they use all the features that we've seen before. So far basically you learned about the syntax and semantics of C++ and what you learn in the following are basically just extensions and show how to use those basic concepts to build really terrific patterns. So today we are talking about software design patterns in particular, which show you a certain, um, which give you kind of an idea how to structure code to achieve certain goals. And we then use an example, which is the smart pointer pattern as part of this software design patterns. So before we start with software design patterns, I wanted to mention some key design principles that we can follow when we use object-oriented programming. There are various design principles that you can find online. We've decided to include the SOLID design principles. And what does SOLID stand for? It stands for S is for single responsibility principle, O for open closed principle, L for the list of substitution principle, I for interface segregation principle, and D for dependency inversion principle. So what do all those things mean? Well, like the single responsibility principle means that a class should have only a single responsibility. It means changes to one part of the software specification should be able to affect the specification of this particular class. So what does it mean? I should not create a person car or person manipulation car <laughs> class or something. I should kind of try to find out a single responsibility like this class is responsible to control people. This class is representing a person. This class is representing a student. Yeah, so I, I should try to keep things as simple as possible and separate it. So the open close principle, the O of the solid, means software entities should be open for extension but closed for modification. So what does it mean? So like when we have a hierarchy, like our person or people student hierarchy, we should be able to extend this kind of hierarchy providing something like part-time student or having some person that is like a doctor or something like that. But we should not be able to, in terms of modification, to change the overall behavior of something like a person. Yeah. So like when you implement a doctor and you try to change from a this person the name, it should not, it should actually change the name. It shouldn't do anything else. Yeah, it should not change the behavior. So in that sense, we are open for extensions, but we are closed to modify the existing and expected behavior of our classes. So the Liskov substitution principle, so Liskov was a person that has coined this term. That means that objects in a program should be replaceable with instance of their subtypes without altering the correctness of the program. Yeah, so that has to do with the object-oriented programming. Again, with the class hierarchy, we know when we create a child class, so when we inherit and we use the public interface, like again, our student person hierarchy. Yeah, A student is a person. We should not change the behavior of a person, of the underlying person, when we re-implement kind of uh, the student's methods, yeah? So a, st a student should be a person and it should behave like a person when you use the methods of a, of a person, even if you have polymorphism. So um, interface segregation means that you should have many specific interfaces instead of having one general purpose interface. I think that stands by itself. Dependency inversion means that you should depend upon abstractions and not concrete concretions. So not specific kind of implementation. Try to build very good abstractions and your life is so much easier. Yeah, there is a lot behind this and I could probably talk a day about this. And this was really a brief, gives you some brief ideas what you should look for when you design an object oriented program. But there's so much more I really, try to encourage you to read more about how to design good code. And believe me, it's really difficult. It's like writing a good book. Yeah. Can you write a good science fiction book? 
I can't, right? But I, I still can do, write, you know, and speak English. So that may, is kind of where you are in terms of programming, right? You, you may have know and understand the syntax and semantics of your coding, but you may still struggle to build really big and coherent wor works. And that's kind of what we are talking about here. Those principles help you to build proper codes and larger projects, which is really the bread and butter of computer science. So I really encourage you to look into it. So now, what are software design patterns and how do they fit in this narrative? Well, the idea is that we have a design pattern, which is a general and reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem in software design. And it's typically well understood by software developers. And that means if you use this design pattern, you ease the communication and you ease the documentation because it's well known. Yeah. So there are different types of design patterns. A creational pattern is kind of subsumizing the ability to create objects in a controlled way based on certain criteria. We have structural patterns which organize classes and objects into larger structures. We have behavioral patterns which provide common communication patterns between objects. And concurrency, well, this is a bit, I think, advanced. It deals with multi-threaded programming paradigms. Yeah, but creational, structural, and behavioral patterns, they are really great for you to learn about. And I think it's beneficial, again, because if you use those patterns, you, you will be able to build really large programs that are easily to use, easily to maintain. Yeah, in that sense, really useful. Okay. Um, generally speaking, design patterns are out of scope of the lecture, but they are often uh, liked and enjoyed by companies that you try to work for. So in that sense, again, it, it gives you patterns like to construct a good book. Yeah. When you think again about the science fiction book, I can give you some ideas how to build a book and you learned a little bit. So you should have kind of some idea um, to build a story throughout the book, right? And it should have some kind of climax in terms of action. And it should have certain elements, right? Like his character descriptions and so on. And there are ideas how to introduce new characters and so on. All those components when you write a good book, yeah, there are kind of design patterns for writing a book. So they give you an idea how to build a book. And it's really the same here. We learn design patterns to build great products yeah, and become architects. So here's a good link. Software design patterns, and there are many books out there, hundreds of pages that describe software design patterns. What I wanted to introduce to you are a couple of patterns today that are enjoyable and that show you how this concept works. So we will first look at a creational pattern, the factory method. So what is the factory method? Well, it means we create a class, a so-called factory class, that decides which class we actually instantiate based on some user requirements. Like I need a certain interface, I have certain properties, and this class makes the decision what object to instantiate. The benefit is that we create a level of abstraction. When I try to use this class, this factory class, to create instances, I don't have to know which implementation is actually used, because that's decided by the factory me method. So that means as having a framework that creates objects like this, I can expand the framework with new and better implementations and the user has not to choose, right? The, the method chooses for the user. So the users in particular don't have to call any constructor of those objects that it tries to create because the method decides upon the class to use. So look, let's have a look at in UML as a, into a maze game. And you could think of that you have a, a a maze game that has the operation make a room. Okay? And this class, the class maze game here, is the factory class that makes a decision when we call make room what type room we create. If you play a game such as Diablo, for example, or World of Warcraft, let's say, um, then when, when you go into a room and you exp explore kind of this environment, then the system has to decide you know, what does the next environment for the player look like? Like, will it, will, you know, will it, the room look like lava, for example? Will the next stage look like this and this? What, what is the characteristic of the next stage? Yeah, this is abstracted in this 
functionality of this make room. So it ma can, can make the decision to create, a, like, like I said, um, a room full of lava, for example, or a, an ice world or something like that. Yeah. And here in this place, what we have, we have a magic maze game, which is a child class of maze game. When this one is used, it may decide in the make room a method to instantiate magic rooms. Yeah. So every time you call make room, it will create magic rooms. Maybe it will create rooms of a certain property again. But uh, our basic maze game may create, you know, rooms for different, like I said, um, yeah, environment, environment such as lava, ice, world, air world, or something like that. Okay, if this was a bit too abstract, let's go a bit down to our people and student relationship. And sometimes we want to create a deeper class hierarchy of person. You know, like a doctor, we may want to have um, part-time students, maybe drug drivers, um, yeah, PhD students, whatever, right? So consider we have a very deep class hierarchy of person that covers all the different possibilities here. Um, so we have a person class and we have to make it virtual. That's the key part of this exercise. It, because without virtual, we know um, there is no polymorphism, but we need polymorphism for this idea of factories to work properly because the user need to, does not have to know what kind of person it is. They will just invoke the typical methods. So here we see a class hierarchy where we have a student as is a person, employee is a person, part-time student is actually a student and an employee. And we may have actually something like a transformer, you know, transformers, um, they are so machines and they can be transformed uh, into something that looks a bit like a robot and stuff. Um, yeah, let's assume a transformer is a person. A transformer could also be a car at the same time. Um, yeah, but you know, let's make it simple. And yeah, this is now our class hierarchy and we could think of there are a lot of methods in person present like a name, NHS numbers, what have you, right? But I, I just abstract here to the basics. So let's consider we have a class hierarchy that looks like this. By the way, there's one uh, syntactical concept that I wanted to introduce today, which is virtual. So virtual in inheritance. So what it means is um, when we have virtual, here we have a virtual, virtual public person, it's just a student. Uh, it has to do with the diamond problem. What is the diamond problem? It means in this case, we have, for example, a part-time student and a part-time student is a student and it's an employee, but the employee is already a person and a student is already a person. So if you would try to do that without virtual, you will get a problem because a part-time student is now basically two times a person. Yeah, but we want to be the part-time student to be only one person. And that's why in a nutshell, we have to put here virtual. There's more to it, the keyword. And um, I just wanted to introduce you real quick, have a, have a look on this advanced concept. If you, it's just important to know it's there. And if you encounter this, a problem during compilation, think about this diamond problem and virtual. Okay, let's have a look how we implement now our factory for, per, for people. So somehow our function should decide what type of person we want to create based on some properties. Yeah, and we want to change this behavior depending on our needs. So for example, consider we have our, we want to use this kind of people factory that we know are building. We, we want to say create a person and this person, it should work and it studies, right? So who would you create now, right? If you call such a method. Well, we probably would create in this case a part-time student, right? But imagine we don't have yet implemented part-time student, so this functionality could just create a student. Would be possible. And this, the user doesn't have to know anything. The user just deals with a person, pointer to a person in fact, and uh, calls methods to it. In the second case, we try to create a person that is a car. Well, in this case, we would probably create a transformer, right? Um, yeah. Well, there are many ways to, you know, work with such persons. 
if you try to figure out what uh, type this actually is, that of object we created, we can use this runtime type information that is only available when we use polymorphism, which means we have to use virtual as part of a method, which we did here for the destructor to support polymorphism, right? So we can use the type ID function and then dot name. This prints out, in fact, we created a part-time student and a transformer. So what we can do in the implementation, when we try to create a person that is a car and works, we could, for example, throw an exception. Yeah, here we throw an accept, a standard exception saying we, this is not yet supported, not yet implemented, for example. All this possible, but we can still compile this code. Okay, from the user side, we can always compile this code and we can put all these properties. So that's a nice decoupling between implementation and the usage of our program. Actually, let's have a look how this factory looks like. Well, here, when we create a person, we, we add a vector of strings, which are our properties. And now we try to find out if we want to create a car, if this person works, or if it studies. So we just go through this um, array, basically, and find out if there is a property car, works, or studies. Yeah, and then we make this selection. If, if certain properties are set, we return those objects. So you see, the constructor is still called but based on certain um, properties that we need. Yeah, and if we can't make a decision, well, we throw an exception. Again, this can be extended. So that shows you the idea of a factory method, this idea of a, a creational pattern, a software design pattern, but there are others as well. And we will next look as into another very useful pattern in a moment.